This morning we come to a new study in the life of our church. The first three years, um, over the last six the first, that I've been here, the first three years, we studied the Gospel of John in the life of our church. Some of you who are new to us would say, you're kidding me. You spent three years in one book of the Bible? And much to Miguel Morgado's amazement, yes, we did. He kept saying, Pastor, I don't understand. By, if I do the math, it's going to take three years. And I said, Miguel, you're right. It's going to take three years. So we did that. And then we looked to the book of Jude. And we studied the timely message of the book of Jude. The timely message of the fact that there are many who have fallen away from the gospel. There are many false teachers that have come and deceived many. And we saw that that wasn't only happening back in the first century, but that is happening in this century, and it's happened in every century in between these, two, in this 2,000-year period. And so the importance of looking at God's Word. And then we came to the study of the book of James. James writing the first letter to any church anywhere. This was, James was the, the beautiful first letter coming out of Jerusalem, helping this new Christian movement, especially to the Jewish congregations, helping them to understand the gospel and understand that religiosity should not be laid over on top of the gospel of Christ, that Christ has come and made all things new and that he's called us to believe in a, in a very basic and true obedience to the gospel. Now we come in our study to the book of Titus. This morning I want to spend a few minutes helping you get orientated on this great, powerful little three chapters toward the center part of your New Testament. If you have your Bible, take it and turn with me to the table of contents. I want you to see the table of contents. In the table of contents, you see, of course, the Old Testament that is above. Um, this was the Jewish scriptures that were foretelling a Messiah would come. If you're new to the study of the Bible, we want you to know that the Old Testament is God's working from creation all the way through to the promised Messiah. And then we come to the New Testament. The New Testament is when that Messiah comes, it is God, the second person of the Trinity, coming and rescuing mankind from his sin just as had been promised, just as had been foretold in the Old Testament, God delivers on his promise and sends Jesus, Yeshua, Yahweh saves, that is his name, and he comes and he fulfills his name. Jesus dies on the cross for our sins. He rises again, overcoming sin and death. And he says, all who believe in me can have eternal life. And so we come to see that. Now, the New Testament is the story of Christ's life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the story of Jesus' life here on the earth. And then we come to the book of Acts. This is the history lesson of what happens after Jesus ascends back to the Father and the church begins to grow. The book of Acts is one of the most exciting things that you can read in the world. It is God moving and working in the early church as the church explodes out across the Mediterranean. And then we see a long list of letters after that. These letters, are, some of them are written to individuals, some of them are written to churches. And so we come and we see that this morning we're going to be beginning the little letter of Titus. Notice that it is just after First and Second Timothy. As you're sitting there making a mental note, I want you to recognize that Titus is very similar to 1 Timothy. If you read 1 Timothy, that is Paul writing to Timothy, you will see several things that are similar as he's also writing to another young protege, a young pastor in the, in the Mediterranean world. He is writing to Titus and he writes some similar things. So then turn over there in the book of Titus to um, uh, that part of the Bible after First and Second Timothy. And this morning we're going to read the letter of Titus. It um, makes sense that churches read the scripture. In fact, the apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Timothy, give attention to the public reading of scripture. It's amazing that in this day and time, you can go to churches within a very short distance of this church and hear sermons that don't read any scripture 
or in a nuanced way, mention the Scripture. Friends, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is based upon the truths of this book. The church of God finds its being in the living Word of God. In fact, Jesus is called the Word, the living Word. And so we see that God's Word is what brings life to our midst and into our lives, into our congregation. Uh, This morning I've asked the pastors to come and help me with this. They are going to read chapter 1, 2, and 3. You see it on your outline that is there. And uh, so this is an appropriate way for us to begin. We read the letter, and then this morning we're going to look at some background issues so that our study over the next several months will make a lot of sense. Um, So um, I encourage you to get out your outline there, get a pen in hand, get ready to mark some things that you you note, um, and we'll be able to use this in the days ahead. Now, the other thing that I would just draw your your attention is, in your outline, there are some holes um, in that, and that is so that you can put it in a notebook. Um, We haven't mentioned this in a while. For those of you who are new to us, um, many of our members take home the notes and go through them during the week um, over this next series, over this next few months as we study the book of Titus together. And um, you can buy a notebook in in uh, in the bookstore, um, they're nearly free. They're, they're very inexpensive. We just uh, charge whatever we pay for them. Um, so you can pick up a notebook and keep your notes together. But let's come, and let's come to the glorious Word of God. Let me pray before we read it as a church family together, asking God's blessing upon this study of this glorious letter in Sheridan Hills' lives. Let's pray together. Lord, we turn now to read your Word We are so grateful that your word brings life. Psalm 119 reminds us over and over again, Lord, that we are revived according to your word, that your word brings the joy and the truth that the human heart so longs for. I pray that this morning that as we read this letter that you inspired Paul to write to Titus, that you have preserved for 2,000 years for the church, that we would receive it for all that you intend. I pray, Holy Father, that you would use your divine words in our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us. I pray that you would instruct us. I pray that this morning that you would correct us. Lord, that we would be open to your rebuke. Lord, that we may experience life and all that you have in godliness for us. So, Lord, as we read, I pray that you would come and speak. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Amen. Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order, and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers, and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant, or quick-tempered, or a drunkard, or violent, or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. 
Therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, self in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the young man to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works and in your te teaching, sound, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Chapter 3. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing, and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. And this is the word of God to Titus. This is the letter of Titus, written by a great missionary gospel-preaching pastor, 
to a young protege, and it's so very practical. You see at the end of that, I mean, I know many of you just turned your sheet over, but look back there at the end where we were just sitting there in verse 12. In verse 12, we see how practical this, how real this letter is. This isn't a make-believe form letter. This is a real letter from one man to another man, and it's written in the context of helping God's people know God, walk with God, honor God, be spared from false teaching. We, we're going to see over this period of time. Look what he says in verse 13. Do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer. Even Paul wanted his lawyer to come and help him. I'm, I don't know what Zenos was doing. We're, we're not sure about that. And Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. He's saying take care of them, care for them, meet their needs. Even if there's been a difficulty, help them. Let our people learn to devote themselves to good works. He circles back on that in verse 14. And so as to help um, the the whole process of those who have needs, cases of need, and not be unfruitful. So this is a very, very practical letter. I want you to notice back on the front side our title box. And in fact, then the screen in front of you where it says Titus. There are three big things that we're going to gain out of Titus over the next few months. We're going to see the importance, once again, of believing the right thing, right doctrine. You see that up there in the box at the top. You see the importance of what? Right leaders. In fact, the Apostle Paul is writing to Titus saying, you need to be very careful that the church has the right leaders. If the church has the wrong leaders, they are going to go the wrong way. So this is a very important thing. I want to encourage you as we look at 1 Timothy, as we look at at Titus, as we see areas in the Scripture, as we look at the book of Acts that deal with issues of leaders, Every Christian in a church needs to tune in because leadership is a very, very key issue in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see there's going to be the need for right doctrine. We saw that in the book of Jude. We saw that in the book of James. We see it again now. I mean, you, you, the, the Mediterranean world was filled with all kinds of different problem doctrines from the Jewish side of life seeking to bring the law, the Judaizers seeking to bring the law and the rituals back onto the church, to the pagan side of life, the whole Greek side of life, the Roman side of life, where there was other mythologies or just pure selfishness, hedonism, paganism of the Roman Empire. All of these different views that are now coming against the truth of the gospel. So we see right doctrine, right leaders, right leaders, and then you notice the last one. What is the last one that we have there? Right living. Throughout this letter, we see how Christians are supposed to live. That what they believe and where they're going with their leaders is that it has to do with their godliness and how they live. Do they look like the world? Do they live like the world? Or are they living like God's people? This is always important to God. From from the, the earliest chapters of Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation, we see it matters the way we live. And God has called us to live according to him. Now, I want to say to you that um, I personally believe, and you can flip your sheet back over and look at the backside. I personally believe that studying biblical backgrounds is really, really important. There are many times when um, throughout, especially cultural Christianity as opposed to biblical Christianity, You know, a a pastor just feels the need to have a nice outline, you know, three points in a poem, and, you know, if you can tell a moving story that, you know, that maybe gets a tear or something like that or a great laugh or something like that, you know, that that people's hearts have been touched and then they go away kind of feeling good. I, I can just tell you that Sheridan Hills has no interest in that. We don't want sermonettes for Christianettes who smoke cigarettes. I mean, I mean that, that's not what we're interested in. What we're interested in 
is looking at the Word of God and saying, Lord, these words have been preserved for us and that we need to come and know your Word. You know, Jeremiah would say, I've taken your words and I've eaten them and they give me life. In Isaiah, God's word says that the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Psalm 119 says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. You see, God's word comes and helps us, encourages us, builds us, enables us to be the people that he's called us to be. Now, we have to study his word. And part of that is knowing the background of where it comes from. I want you to notice on this that I, I put this on your outline. I want you to see this. That biblical backgrounds are important. And I, just my own testimony is, I, I kind of grew up in a tradition where sometimes we got biblical backgrounds and the history of it, and sometimes we didn't. And I remember... Um, go, moving away, going up to Florida State, and starting to grow on my own as a Christian at Florida State. And I remember that as I started to study the Bible more, I had a hunger to know, wait a minute, why does it say that? Why did he use those words? Why did he use that phrase? What in the world does this mean? And so I started to realize that the more I studied the context around it, the more I could understand the actual words. And then I was privileged to go to seminary. And when I went to seminary, I found that one of my favorite classes in all of my seminary studies was a class called Biblical Backgrounds, where Biblical Backgrounds looks at the setting of the Old Testament and looks at the setting of the New Testament and studies what's going on in the world around it. Why did Moses write what he write, wrote? Why did the Israelites do what they did? What, what were their traditions? What were their circumstances? Even where were they? What was the geography like? Was it hot? Was it cold? Was it, was it remote? Was it not remote? Was it a land flowing with milk and honey? Or was it a wilderness? You see, all of these things, as we begin to see the context of the Bible, it makes so many things clearer. There's many times when many of you have opened the Bible, you read something, you go, what in the world does that mean? I don't understand that. And then how many times have you closed the Bible thinking, I, I just don't understand that? I want to say to you that biblical backgrounds and studying biblical backgrounds as you read the Bible can help unlock key things in the scriptures. Dr. Bill Toller was one of my professors at um, Southwestern Seminary, and um, he, was, he was hilarious. He, he spoke at about 300 words a minute. You could not keep up with it. I had to record the classes because I had to go home and, and work through it and understand it. But he had such a knowledge of the biblical background around the scripture. It just, it just made my heart glad to learn the setting of the Bible. So we look at the author, we look at the audience, who, who is it intended for? The place, the date, the genre, the cultural setting, the concurrent surrounding issues um, that were there. And here, you can fill this in. Knowing the context, and what does context mean? That means with the text. Con means with, and then text. So if you think about that, what goes with the text? How does it weave together? In fact, that's even another part of it. If you, if you look at the word context, it literally means woven together. So you have these different things as if it's a piece of fabric and it's woven together. One thread does not stand on its own very often. You can't do very much with one thread, but when you put a bunch of threads together, what can you do? You can do a lot of things, all kinds of things. Um, so that's the idea of understanding context. This is hugely important. And so this morning, I just want to lay the groundwork for just a few moments about what is it going to be as we study this book of the Bible. First of all, I want us to see the author. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't keep going here unless the guys are keeping up with me. Um, so woven together is part of what that means. The author, as we said, is the Apostle Paul. You see that in verse 1. He says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Christ Jesus, or of Jesus Christ. And all the way through, verse 1, 2, and 3, we see this as this statement 
opening up, saying who Paul is. Now, we're going to take a few weeks and study what all is there because it is one big, long, run-on sentence that is packed with meaning for us. But Paul is writing, you see that in verse 1, and he's writing to verse 4, it says, to who? To Titus. Well, let's look and remember who Paul is. Paul is a missionary. He's a missionary that is, is spreading the, the knowledge of God's word, spreading the truth through the calling of the Holy Spirit in order to allow the people of the Mediterranean world in the first century to hear the gospel. Now, I put a long paragraph underneath that part that says author. I want you to notice this. For those of you who are new to studying the Bible, you need to understand who Paul was. Number one, he was a Jewish Pharisee, and he was a Jew among Jews. I mean, he wasn't just a, a Jewish Pharisee, but he was trained in the school of Gamaliel, who was a brilliant scholar in his day. So Paul was a true Jew. But he was also, interestingly enough, unlike many, he was a Roman citizen. Many Jews were not Roman citizens. He was. He spoke Hebrew and Greek, along with some other indications of some other languages, but he, he operated easily in either language, G Hebrew with Jews, Greek with the whole Roman world. He was a persecutor of Christians. In fact, notice this one, he was present when Stephen was stoned. Stephen was the first person killed for his faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul would write later that he stood by holding the cloaks of those who were stoning Stephen to death. And as Stephen prayed for God's forgiveness for those who were stoning them, Paul looked on, the Bible tells us, in hearty agreement. So he was glad to see Stephen stoned to death. We're talking about a guy who was opposed to the gospel. He was struck down by the Lord on the road to Damascus. And he was converted on that road to Damascus to Christ, to faith in Christ. He was transformed in an instant. And in an instant, he came to see that the one that he was persecuting was indeed the Savior of the world. He was discipled by Barnabas. And he was called to preach to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. Now, interestingly enough, he was a bivocational kind of pastor. That means he did full-time ministry work and he did full-time other work at different times. He would support himself. In fact, he was a tent maker. He would, would make tents and sell tents for a living. And he wrote much of the New Testament. Part of what we see here is the letter that he wrote. Now, that's the author who writes this. And what about the recipient? The recipient is a guy named Titus. By his name, we know that he was Greek. Um, he was ultimately a pastor more than a missionary. We don't have a lot of record of Titus traveling after this time very much. He traveled with Paul. We see that in the book of Acts. He's referenced in, in various other places in the New Testament. But here we see that he's commissioned to stay in Cyprus and get a job done and the, as they are establishing churches. So he's ultimately more of a pastor than he is a missionary, a traveling missionary. He's a Greek, perhaps a brother of Luke. We don't know that, but there's some similarities there in the way they say things, that perhaps he was a brother of Luke. Um, he's from Antioch. He's converted to Christ early with Paul. He met Paul at Antioch around the year 49 or 50. Now, Christ would, would um, have ascended to the Father somewhere around 33 AD, so this is some years later. As time has gone on, the church has been growing, spreading across the Mediterranean world. And as we said, he traveled with Paul and Barnabas, and he's left in Crete to finish up their work of planting churches. So Paul was with him there. They plant churches. They see all of these people come to faith in Christ, and he's left there in this place. Now, it's time to move to the place of Crete. I want you to see that this is the context in which Titus finds himself. Crete 
is one of the islands of the Mediterranean world that's from Greece. And I, I want you to have some context here and see this a little bit, um, especially this one right here. Crete is where the yellow circle is. You see North Africa across the bottom of the, of the screen that is there, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt. And then over in that little pocket is Jerusalem and Israel, uh, Palestine that is there. And then you come up around, we would call that Asia Minor, there'd be Turkey and then eventually Greece. And then you see this boot of Italy where Rome was. Now, the island of Crete is this big island right in the middle of the Mediterranean. It is a beautiful place. We're gonna zoom in here a little bit. Um, notice it's really right between Greece and Turkey. And so there's lots of commerce that is sailing by it. Wherever there's a, there's a battle before the Roman Empire, um, after the Roman Empire, Crete, like Malta and like Cyprus, are very involved with that. On the far right side of your screen, you see another island. That's the island of Cyprus. That's not the one that Titus is on. He's on Crete. Notice this image. It's out there in the, uh, uh, really at the southern part of the Aegean Sea, and as, the, as you come up on the Mediterranean, it's called the Libyan Sea. Just below that, that's the area between the bottom of Crete and Libya. Um, but it's about 150 miles long. So it's not a very small island. In fact, if you were to go there today, you can find cities kind of spread out across the island. Notice that there's several of them there, and there's even some highways. They're not very big highways. They're actually small roads, and it takes about four hours to drive 150 miles. So, you know, it would be rather slow um, in going, but notice these pictures. I want you to get an idea of the people that are receiving this, these instructions and who would be there. Um, it is a beautiful island. It's a beautiful place. Um, it has large mountains. It has beautiful canyons that are there. People go and they travel there to hike, they travel there to see it, go through many of those canyons. Um, as any of the areas around the, uh, the Mediterranean, especially the Aegean Sea, the water is very often very clear, though many places on the island are a little bit deserty, similar to Patmos. You remember we recently spoke about Patmos, where um, the Apostle John wrote um, first, second, and third John, and where he wrote the book of Revelation from. This would be not unlike that, but this would be a much larger island. Patmos is a tiny island that was really used as a bit of, a, of an exile for John, a bit of a prison for John. Um, Patmos, excuse me, Crete, would have been a much larger and, in fact, beautiful place. If you were to go there today, you would find thriving, beautiful Mediterranean cities that are there. Um, I imagine there may be a few people here in this congregation that have been there. Some of you are thinking, okay, where's my plane ticket? I'm going to go. I want to go and be there. I, I, I think in the Roman world, the Romans were very good at finding beautiful places, and they, and they developed them well. It, it probably was very beautiful, similar to this, even during that time. All over the island are Roman ruins from the day of the beautiful Roman Empire. And there's even Greek ruins that are there from the Greek Empire before that. Some of them have been reconstructed so you can begin to get an idea of the grandeur of the society in which Titus would have been, would have been living and pastoring. Uh, many of those Romans, Roman ruins have been preserved. Then fortresses would have come along and been built. Um, there were many different battles over Crete Everybody wanted Crete because it was so strategic. All of these things play into the meaning of many of Paul's words, as we're going to see in the next few months. This background helps you understand, especially when it sounds like the Apostle Paul is saying some very racist things about Crete. I mean, you read that a few minutes ago. Yeah, all, it has been said by a Greek philosopher that this is how these people are, and Paul says, it's true. You say, that doesn't sound very politically correct. What does that mean? Well, hold on a few weeks. We'll look at that. But all of this plays in. People have been battling over this area for a long time because of its strategic value. But as we look at it, we do come to look at the people that are there. What kind of people that are there? 
You see, part of this that plays into this are the true Christians, the church members that are there. These are the folks. They're not only talking about the leadership of them, but talking about the people that are there that are followers of Christ. You see, many of them would have been Jews and Gentiles, young and old, men and women. Most are from Crete. They're Cretans. Um, and we, we come to find that as Paul deals with these people, he is identifying the fact that we need the right leaders that are there, but also not only the right leaders, but we come to see that the members are called to the right living. They're called to live in a way that is honoring to God. Now, when you think about all of the ships that would have been sailing past Crete and all of the ports that were there, there would have been both military people coming in without families and there would have been sailors coming in without families. When you get military men, a bunch of men together without their families, and you get a bunch of um, merchant marine guys together without their families, they don't all, all the time behave very well. We have some sailors in this church that are based out of Fort Lauderdale, and they're very godly men and godly women. Uh, we've had a ministry to them over the years from time to time. It's a great ministry, and you find true Christian sailors that are there. But let me tell you that most sailors aren't known for their Christianity. Have you ever heard the phrase, oh, he cusses like a sailor? Um, the Roman world, the average military rank-and-file soldier was a pretty rough guy. And they were very, very powerful. And so Crete is this place where there's a lot of that coming through. And so Crete becomes this this big business hub that has lots of wealth flowing through there, and there's a, there's a, lot, of, a lot of worldly ideas and philosophies coming through there, and then there's also the whole military power thing going on, and so the people on Crete weren't known for their godliness. In fact, the people on Crete were known for just the opposite of that. I was reminded um, last night as I was praying and studying about um, a story that I heard of the showing of the Jesus film um, one time uh, in Africa. Uh, the Jesus film that depicts the life of Christ tells the whole story of Jesus coming, being born, raising up, preaching uh, the truth of God, and then um, there toward the time of the crucifixion coming, it shows the whole passion story where Judas comes and kisses him on the cheek and betrays Jesus over to um, his adversaries. And then Jesus is nailed to the cross. And uh, the, the film you know, goes through the whole process, shows the picture, even the resurrection. And after the whole thing is done, with one particular guy, a friend of mine, Brian Owen, um, told me this as a second-hand story. He had heard it from somebody who had seen it. They asked the tribe, well, what did you think of the story? And they said, well, we liked Judas. And they said, no, you mean, you mean I know they sound the same, but you mean Jesus. And they were like, no, the brilliant deceiver, he, he's the hero of the story. And as time went on, they, they started to realize, wow, this culture, the greatest, highest thing that you can do is treachery and deception and betrayal. Now, it's almost like, based upon the comments that Paul is making and some of the, the things that we can read from Cretan philosophy, it's almost like the Cretans would have had an attitude like that. Oh, the hero is Judas. Look at his brilliant betrayal. Now, as we're looking at it, can you imagine seeking to plant churches in that context? That would be a hard thing, right? And, and, and can you imagine seeking to pastor people that live in a society that's, that's kind of like that? That's a difficult thing. And so we, we begin to see a little bit of insight into the troubles that are there. Now, before we're too hard on the Cretans... We live in South Florida. My sister comes down from South Carolina, 
And I have other friends that come down from other areas up in New England, out in some of the more rural areas, and they say, man, this place is kind of rough. I go to the mall, I get run over. People kind of push through. She said, you know, uh, I mean, Kelly said, I've been gone for a while, and I kind of forgot. Now, we're not just talking about the niceties of things. But there's a lot of things that come out of Southern California, and there's a lot of things that come out of South Florida, and there's a lot of things that come out of the big metro centers of media and all of the other things that are very, very worldly and very, very powerful. So, I mean, this isn't Alabama. This isn't Oklahoma, where the manger scenes last month are all over the courtyard lawns, as I just saw. I thought, wow, we're not in... Florida anymore. So we are going to benefit as we study this of seeing how the gospel still comes and changes our behavior, changes our lives if we allow God's word to speak. I want you to notice a few things as we, as we finish up. One of the great things, one of the great problems that Paul is talking to Timothy about is this players number two is false teachers. So it's not just the church members Um, and many of them true Christians, I believe, but it's talking about the false teachers. And have you noticed that in our studies of the New Testament, false teaching just keeps coming up and coming up and coming up because it's so prevalent. Christians in this day and time need to be aware that there is false teaching all over the place, very prevalent right here in South Florida, all around the world, all over the Internet. Um, We need to see what is their problem. But their problem is wrong doctrine, first of all. They are teaching the wrong things. They're teaching things that are not in accordance with God's word, not faithful to the truth of the gospel. But secondly, we also see that is so often the case, false teachers are also living the wrong way. So, and, and that makes sense, because if they don't have the true gospel, they don't have the true doctrine of what is right, they also are living in accordance with their own desires. And we see that. They're seeking to lord over or they're seeking to manipulate. We saw in the book of Jude that he is saying, hey, there's people preaching Christ that want to do it just so they can make money. There's people preaching Christ um, just so they can have sexual favors. You say, that's in Jude? Yeah, go read Jude this afternoon. It's only 25 verses long. Go look at it. Be blown away. And, and the Apostle Paul warns, Jude is warning in this, and we see the Apostle Paul warning here, that you better be careful who is your teacher. You better make sure that he's saying the right things, he's teaching the truth of God, and that his life lives it out, his life backs it up. Otherwise, you're going to be deceived and misled. And so... Wrong doctrine, wrong living, wrong leaders. This is a problem. This is a problem not only on Crete, but this is a problem in 2018 worldwide. And Christians are called to be aware of the differences. And so that is part of what we're going to be helped with. As we run to the Word of God, as we look at the true gospel of Christ, as we are faithful to the text, as we see the context, as we understand the culture, as we see the words in the syntax and all that the Holy Spirit has put in this little letter of of Titus, I believe that we are going to be encouraged. And I want you to see two ways that we're going to be encouraged as I close. I think that you're going to be, you're just going to be absolutely amazed in a beautiful, the, the beautiful picture of Titus chapter 1 and verse 1. Notice what it says here. For the sake of the faith of God's elect, that's his children, it's the ones that God is calling out of the world to believe upon him. For the sake of the faith of, faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, there it is, their knowledge of the truth, you've got to have the truth, in order to be able to walk, and look at this, which accords with godliness. Now, this phrase is important to the whole book of Titus. Truth and godliness. Truth and godliness. You have to know the truth, and you have to live the truth. It's it's the truth that shows us how to live in godliness, and we're going to see that even more beautifully in the next verse that is here. 
Back in Titus chapter 3, verse 4 through 8, in a couple months we'll be studying this, but I want you to see verses 4 through 8, and we see where the godliness gets afforded to us and how this comes to be. Look with me at verse 4, and it's really at the top of your outline right up there just above this um, under Titus. It starts really at the very top where it says chapter 3 continued. Look at verse 4. And get ready to mark a couple of things. But when the goodness, that word goodness is important. And when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. Look at verse 5. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us richly through Christ Jesus. Here is the truth that the folks in Starting Point last hour just looked at. We looked at the difference between cultural Christianity that says you come to God through good works versus biblical Christianity that says that you come to God through the work of Christ. Jesus dies on the cross for our sins. We cannot save ourselves by our works. We must transfer all of our trust into the work of Christ, the finished work of Christ on the cross. When he cried out before he gave up his spirit and he said, it is finished, which means paid in full. And so if you look with me at verse 4 and 5, this is the picture of the true gospel. And if there's any hope that we're going to live godly lives, it is found here, not in our works of righteousness. Look at verse 5. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of... That's beautiful. The washing of regeneration. He makes us alive again. And renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Look at verse 7. So that being justified by his what? Circle it. So that being justified by his grace. We're made right. Justified means to be made right with God. So that being justified, made right with God by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of, look at it, eternal life. Verse 8, he ends this statement. I want you to see this. This saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things. Would you underline that? I want you to insist on these things. I want you to hear Paul's passion about this. Paul is not saying, Timothy, or excuse me, Titus, I kind of want you to think about emphasizing this a little bit more as opposed to this. That is not Paul's attitude. Paul is looking at this young protege in this faith, faith, this young pastor, and he's saying, Titus, you have to say this. You have to build this into the DNA of those churches. You have to teach this truth. It is not optional. Look what he says in verse 8. The saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to what? Circle good works. He wants us to be devoted to good works. That's not because we want to be saved. It's because we are saved. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. It is a blessing to God, and it is a blessing to those around us when we are living in the good works of God, not going with the culture, not running just for ourselves, but learning to live as a true Christian in godliness. And where does it all come it comes from God himself in this. So um, these, these beautiful pictures, this beautiful verse, look at the last part there. He's saying, I want you to insist on this. Now, friends, we should insist on this. We should insist upon our church that we live according to the truth and not be carried away with 
prosperity gospel, not be carried away with easy believism, not be carried away with cultural Christianity that's kind of, I'm okay, you're okay, yeah, there's many ways to, you know, you know not, not exalting the finished work of Christ on the cross and our obedience to it with great joy, calling us to preach this gospel to a world that is in such desperate need of it. Now, what is the source of all of this? I want you to see that the gospel is the source of godliness. Fill that in. The gospel is the source of godliness. There are some people who say, well, I just can't be the Christian that God's called me to be. I have such a hard time. And I want to say to you, well, you're right. You can't. You can't be the Christian that you need to be in your own strength. It's impossible. The only way that that's going to happen is that you allow the transforming power of the Holy Spirit to rule and reign in your heart and to empower you to obey. And we're going to see this throughout the book of Titus. We're going to be encouraged to stand tall in South Florida we're going to be encouraged to stand in this present day of honoring God through the gospel of Christ and seeing God work and move in people's lives.